Welcome to Maynard Kasterison's nonprofit education series, uh, Cybersecurity Training for Nonprofits, and we're happy to have you here today. A few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and everybody will be muted, but if you do have questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the chat and I will be monitoring um, that and we will have some time either during the webinar or at the end to answer your questions. I'd like to introduce you to our speaker today, Doug Davidson. Doug is the Director of Information Technology at GBQ. Doug has extensive knowledge in the areas of information risk management and information security practices. And I know he is very happy to share with you all of his knowledge that could help your organizations. So with that being said, I would like to turn it over to Doug to start your presentation. Thanks, Brandy. Um, I wanna maybe give myself a little bit of street cred in the nonprofit space. I told Brandy, don't read my whole um, description because there's nothing in there about what we do is with nonprofits. My first job out of college was for a chamber of commerce here in, in Columbus. And so I've, uh, after six years there, um, worked my way into management and understand some of the challenges nonprofits have from that perspective. And then uh, GBQ is blessed to be able to serve a lot of the nonprofits here in the Columbus area. Um, we are we have a human services chamber of commerce that serves the greater metropolitan uh, nonprofit community, and we're the cyber advisor for that organization. And so um, have had a, a lot of experience um, working with nonprofits, trying to figure out how to how to support uh, and protect them. I looked at the the sign in list and. Um, we work with St. Vincent's down here. I, know I think there's a St. Vincent's on the call. Um, there's a lot of parallel organizations to the ones we work on down here. So um, I think I've got a good sense of, of what you all need to hear. Um, again, the objectives today, you know, some essential cybersecurity strategies. Um, how do we protect our stakeholders? How do we cultivate a, a cybersecurity culture? I understand when I'm talking to nonprofits, I'm, really, I'm probably talking to two different kinds of organizations. Some nonprofits are large entities, really the way they're organized is the only difference between them and a for-profit business. Um, they have you know, large staff, they have large, uh, what we call a tax surface, which means the, the uh, assets, the information assets that are exposed to, uh, to a bad guy. Um, they may have a lot of regulations. Um, and so those are normal, you know, large to mid-sized businesses. Um, and then I also understand sometimes with nonprofits, I'm talking about an executive director who may be in an office by, by themselves um, or a very small <clears throat> um, organization. And today, these days, that whole organization may all be working from home all the time. And so I'm going to try to speak to both groups as we work through this, um, both the larger firm or larger organizations that have to um, secure themselves like a large firm does, but the smaller organizations that they probably don't have the resources, but they don't have the risk. They, they have some risk, but not as much. So I think we're going to agree um, that cybersecurity risk is real. Um, I've been doing this for 20 some years. Some of the things I'm going to say today, I said 20 years ago, and it, it, it uh, used to be we had to convince people that it was a problem. Not going to read all the, all the stats, but a couple of them that stand out to me. First, um, last year, uh, the FBI logged 880,000 complaints through their complaint center. Uh, same stat from about four or five years ago, and it was under 20,000. So the uh, crimes being reported have exploded, not on this uh, uh, set of statistics, but the FBI reports that 25% of all crime um, is digital crime. And, and so it, it's a real problem. If we, if we lock our doors in our office because we don't want things to walk out, we ought to be taking the same care and diligence to protect ourselves electronically. And then if you come down to the bottom of the list, 74% uh, of cybersecurity breaches are caused by human error, according to a, a very well uh, established, um, great reputation report from Verizon called the Data Breach Investigation Report. Um, there's different statistics, but uh, we'll talk about another one later. Over 75% of targeted cyber attacks start with an email. And then ultimately, 77% of, of firms, organizations, operate without an incident response plan. So crimes rising, our people are the ones that are most attacked, and most of us don't have a plan in place to address uh, if an attack occurs. And so I want to talk today about what we can do to prevent an attack from occurring and also what we need to, to do to be prepared for one. 
So some trends that we're seeing, um, first, ransomware, where a bad actor comes into your system and encrypts your data and then uh, uh, get, presents you with the opportunity to get that data back if you pay generally in Bitcoin. Um, that, that risk and business email compromise where a bad actor gets into your email system and gets between payments are the two largest of the um, two largest risks that we see. And those continue mostly because the, the um, good guys, um, collectively the business community, the nonprofit community, those of us in the field have not um, completely figured out how to stop those kinds of attacks. Um, a lot of firms don't do everything that's necessary. And it, it, essentially because the bad guys make, make money, it, it continues a, a uh, uh, perpetuates a market for them to participate in. Uh, risk management is a management level issue, not an IT issue. That's always been the case, but we're seeing changes in regulations that are forcing that. Uh, if, if you look to um, HIPAA, payment card, um, employee benefit regulations, there's a number of regulations that are now starting to push uh, for management, more management involvement in managing risk. The SEC um, uh, focused on public firms and investment firms um, came out a few years ago with a cyber advisory that said every public board should have a cyber uh, aware board member. What we're seeing in the nonprofit community is a lot of board members are coming from public companies and they know that that's a, 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 a um, it's guidance from the SEC. And so there we're beginning to see cyber aware people invited to boards um, on nonprofits because of that. And, and that generally happens. The SEC guidance tends to roll downhill. And then something we'll talk about in a little bit in this cybersecurity framework, which is a playbook for people to organize their security program around, the 2.0 version of that just came out and has a, a lean to management. Um, so you're going you're gonna to begin to, as, as, as managers and leaders in a nonprofit, you're going to begin to um, see that, that it's not just an IT issue. But um, we're as leaders and and and, uh, and managers are going to be held held to account for for managing the, the cybersecurity risk. There's a growing emphasis as well in regulations, contracts, and cyber insurance on supply chain and third party risk. We do incident response, and almost every one of the incidents that we've responded to um, in the last six months have been third party involved. Um, uh, whether it's um, the ERP system, whether it's uh, a, a source of information or some other offsite processor, um, we're, we're beginning to see quite a bit of an increase as, as are the regulators and cyber carriers. And so there's a, an emphasis on third party risk. There's an emphasis on continuity management and incident response. Again, when 77% of the, the business community organizations in, in business, um, nonprofits included, when 77% of that market doesn't have a plan, the, the regulators and the insurance carriers and um, anybody that you have a contract with, we've seen some of those uh, uh, kinds of statements in, in grants as well. Um, so there's going to be an emphasis on those things. Uh, the cyber liability coverage that I had I talked to you last year, I would have talked about the fact that you're probably facing 30 to 50% increases and perhaps some barriers to even getting coverage. That's loosened up a little bit. Those firms, organizations that couldn't get coverage have exited the market. They're euphemistically self-insured now. They don't have coverage. And um, it, it carriers are a lot better at, at uh, profiling firms. And so there are firms that are experiencing, organizations that are experiencing heavy increases, um, but over across the market increase, the, the coverage has come down to where it's about 10% um, year over year increases. Um, lower risk profile firms or organizations are finding it's um, more accessible than it used to be. And then uh, like, a, like a band that's been playing in a, in a bar, in bars for years, um, and then suddenly gets a hit and it's, it's a, you know, where did they come from? AI has is, is, uh, joined us. Um, it presents a lot of risks as well as rewards. We encourage people to adopt it in their, in their work. Um, they, you probably have AI in some of the applications that you use, whether you know it or not. With the opportunities comes new risks and new regulations. And that's going to be an interesting uh, trend to watch is, is uh, that whole space grows. It actually explodes. 
break down the consequences of a breach. There's monetary loss. There's that direct loss. Loss if funds are lost, either a ransomware payment or your employees are induced to do something like purchase gift cards or there's business email compromise. There's indirect costs to responding to the event. Um, you have to bring a firm in. A lot of times you have to bring accountants in to, to account for what the losses are. Uh, there typically are, are uh, corrections that have to be made to the network. Uh, we need to find out how somebody got in and then kind of under the gun, um, make all those investments to close it down. Uh, more and more, we're beginning to see organizations uh, held to account, again, management held to account that cybersecurity risk is part of that fiduciary responsibility. Um, we're seeing compliance uh, uh, violations have direct regulatory loss as well as indirect legal costs. Uh, uh, there are a number of you all that look like you're in the healthcare space. Uh, a lot of us look to health and human services. And since HIPAA first uh, came into, into existence, um, there've only been about a hundred uh, regulatory actions. And so we work with a lot of organizations that say, doesn't look like the regulators are biting. We're, we're not going to worry so much about it. But the the indirect legal costs are really where the big hit is. We're working with a nonprofit right now that had a breach that they had to report. Um, well, the attorneys brought us in after the fact, um, and we're in there to clean up and help them improve their security posture. Um, no regulatory action. Health and Human Services sent them a letter and, and uh, gave them some requirements to fix their their environment, which we're helping with. Um, but within just a few days of the notice going up on the, the Health and Human Services uh, Wall of Shame, the, the website that lists of breaches, um, there were two national advertising campaigns soliciting class classes for a class action lawsuit. And there are now six class action lawsuits against this nonprofit. So um, typically that pattern, the regulators not as, as toothy or as, as um, uh, impactful as the lawyers are after the fact if there's a if there's a group that that has standing to be able to sue they're probably going to be recruited by an attorney to come after you and then of course reputation damage in the nonprofit space that may mean less volunteers want to work with you that may mean uh, less uh, funders want to uh, provide funds um, it may mean that that the the communities that you serve are less apt to come to you for for service Touched on this just a, a bit, but I want to go through it uh, specifically. So ransomware is the leader, and that's where a bad actor encrypts that data, holds it hostage. Um, you're typically uh, put in a spot where you um, are incurred or asked to, to pay a, a ransom in terms of Bitcoin to get your data back. We encourage people not to pay because many times you don't get your data back. And about 80% of the time when you do get your data back, there's a gift in it, meaning there's more malware um, that uh, means oftentimes that somebody recovers from ransomware, um, stands their network back up, and then something else happens. Um, with ransomware today, organizations are seeing that their data is being taken. So ransomware and data loss oftentimes go together now. I, I, I am a, I'm a bad guy. I encrypt it and ask you to pay to get it back. And then when you get it back, I say, oh, by the way, I have all that data and I'm going to release it publicly if you don't pay me again. A data loss can happen on its own, but oftentimes, again, it's it's partnered with or paired with ransomware these days. Um, third party providers, again, we'll talk about those that a couple different times. I've already mentioned it. It's an incredibly large uh, source of the breach events that we're seeing in the market today. Um, and th that's a an area of, of, of loss. And then our employees, uh, again, 77 or uh, what, 74 percent of 74 uh, percent of um, uh, employees or breaches start with a uh, an event, um, and uh, that's coming in from email. Um, and many times, our employees just doing what they um, what they do, to taking care of the organization. Um, or induced to do things by mistake. Um, and then sometimes employees are the ones that are taking the data, but it's really about protecting your employees um, to help them not make mistakes. That's the issue, not so much worrying about employees taking data. 
So that happens. Um, I guess if you if you've watched the news, the hospital employees and over in the UK were trying to look at uh, um, the princess's medical records. So um, that kind of thing happens, but it's more often somebody's making a mistake. So I'm going to talk about three key strategies to manage the cyber risks. Um, some program best practices, uh, talk about how to, how to pick a, a strong service providers, and then how to be safe online. First, I want to uh, kind of information security 101. When we talk about information security, many times we are talking about uh, confidentiality. Um, the princess's medical records were confidential. The, the data that the nonprofit that's uh, uh, um, suffering under the, the class action lawsuits, that was a confidentiality loss, something that should have been private, that should have only been um, accessed by those privileged to see it, was accessed by somebody else. Um, but there are, other, there are two other characteristics that we focus on. Integrity, when we get into our data, we wanna make sure that it's, it's, it has integrity, that it's accurate. And so a, a ransomware attack um, affects the integrity of the data. There may be other viruses and other types of malware, malicious software that um, create an issue in terms of integrity where the data is, is um, uh, ruined or, or it, maybe not totally, but um, there's, there's false data in it. And then we have an integrity problem. I mean, then availability is really just simply a fancier word for when you want to work, your tools are available. So when I sit down at my keyboard, I can open up my, my office suite, I can get into my ERP, I can get into my medical records, I can get into my marketing materials, it's all there and available for me. So when we talk cybersecurity, we talk information security, it's we wanna keep the data confidential, but we also wanna keep it accurate or, or with integrity. And we wanna make sure that, that not just the data, but the data and systems are available for us to work with. Not gonna read the list. Um, I put this, I assume we're gonna get this out to y'all after this, um, just as a checklist. And I'm gonna step through this in chunks um, as we go through the rest of the presentation. So first is, is you wanna have an annual life cycle of risk management. Um, the first step is assessing risk against the framework. Um, you wanna build a security program to manage that risk. And then you wanna test that program on a regular basis. We, for this is one of those smaller firms, larger firms thing, uh, things for larger firms, we recommend a steering committee, a cross-functional team, uh, not just IT focused, um, that's uh, put together to, to, that uh, matches company culture, that um, has a strategic view of the organization. Um, that The charter of that steering committee is to focus on the risk assessment, managing risk, creating policy, and providing oversight to the program. Um, the, the the typical steering committee ought to include some C-level executive. Uh, it should not just be the CIO. Again, it's not a technical problem. We've done some nonprofit uh, healthcare organizations and helped them form their steering committee. Uh, generally, HR is important. Um, the, if, if it's a medical environment, the, whoever runs the, the nursing um, department uh, or, or, or what the clinical practice, regardless of what it might be, they should have a seat at the table. Um, if fundraising is a big part of your organization, uh, somebody that's raising funds um, might be necessary on the table as well. There's different reasons uh, to bring different people, but typically it needs to be cross-functional. And it, you gotta ask the question, who is responsible? Who's the business owner for the information that we wanna protect? Not just IT, but who works with it from a business process? And then who's gonna be involved if something bad happens? And that's a good way to gauge who should be on that committee. Smaller organizations, you of course, don't need a committee um, and, and, and it would be overkill to uh, put a committee together with a, a, you know, with a three or four person organization or an executive director only kind of a stance. But for the larger firms, that committees or larger organizations, that committee is important. We then advise organizations to select a framework and there's two that we work with quite a bit. The one we work with the most is the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. A, a new version just came out. Um, it is uh, a product of the National Institute of Science and Technology, which means we've all paid for it. It's a federal agency. Uh, it's freely available. 
uh, you can talk to or should be able to talk to your managed service provider or any other IT organization and say, we, I want to uh, build our security out based on the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, you, if you bring a third party assessor in, they can then assess against that framework. Um, it, it's control objectives in six different areas, how, I, how we govern risk, um, how we identify our assets, uh, how we protect those assets, how we detect, respond, and recover to bad to problems or, or bad events against those assets. And so it's it's a, a playbook, if you will, um, that prevents us from having to go into a, a conference room and think for, for days on end about what all we need to do. The other playbook that we use, uh, the Center for Internet Security has a, a, um, a control framework out that's much more technical and it, it scales down to a smaller organization. If I had a nonprofit with five, 10, 15 people in it, I would probably lean towards the sys controls. Um, there's 18 different areas, but in a smaller organization, it's only about 40 controls. Um, fully de deployed, the sys controls are, are over 100, but they're very technical and not as business oriented as the CSF. So we choose the CSF when it's a larger organization. We choose the sys controls when it's a smaller organization because it scales. Um, the next step is to, under the charter of the steering committees, conduct a risk assessment. And well, that's really where we're calculating the, the value of our information um, so that we can understand business impact, understand what threats are against uh, the, those valuable uh, assets, what weaknesses we might have, and how likely something bad might happen. And that allows us to, to rank the findings in a risk assessment. Uh, typically, once a risk assessment is done, uh, it's best practice to focus on the critical risks that are found. So those, those that are going to have an enormous uh, business impact that are highly likely to happen and work your way down from critical to high, um, probably don't even get to the low because there, there's going to be an effort to work on that top end. And that risk assessment allows you to prioritize um, based on um, the, the particular uh, issues that your nonprofit is going to uh, deal with or address. Again, a bigger organization, that's going to be a bigger effort. A smaller organization, um, you can go to either the, the, the CSF website or the SIS controls website and find some information to be able to do your own um, fairly quickly. Large organizations can do that as well, but it's just a little bit more involved. So once we've identified risks, we've got four choices. We can accept it. Um, we're okay with that risk. It's a low risk or it's a high risk, but we... we we're just, we don't have the funds for it, so we're going to accept that we understand that that's a risk that we have to carry. We can transfer that risk. Uh, cyber liability insurance is a way to transfer it uh, to make sure if your third parties are involved that you're transferring uh, as much of the risk as you can to the contract. Um, we can avoid it. And we've had organizations that have chosen not to get involved in the healthcare uh, services because uh, they didn't want to pick up the HIPAA regulatory um, uh, uh, obligation. Um, we've had organizations um, choose not to move buildings into certain parts of town. Um, we've had organizations um, make other decisions, uh, either not to go in the cloud or to not select a, a particular application because they wanted to avoid the risk associated with it. Um, and then most organizations, though, from a risk assessment, um, want to reduce the risks that are found. If they can't accept it, transfer it, or avoid it, then the, the only way to do it is to, to mitigate it or, or reduce that risk. So once you have a risk assessment, you want to have a formal documented cybersecurity plan. Um, for most of our firm, most of the organizations we work with, that means that we are um, looking at the frameworks. We are looking at the controls, the new version of the CSF, the CSF 2.0, has about 130 controls. And a documented program is really just an accounting for how we meet those controls. Um, it needs to be written down so that, it, that it's memorialized and as people come and go, you can re revisit it and, and know that it's there. If there are stakeholders that, that want to know what your program is, 
um, whether it's your board, whether it's a, a granting organization, um, whether it's uh, you know a, a government funder. Um, many times we're seeing uh, organizations be asked to produce those written plans. Um, there are some states I don't I don't believe that Michigan has this requirement. New York, Massachusetts, um, states that are pretty far away from us here in the Midwest um, have re requirements for a written information security plan called a WISP. Um, we just think it's good practice. Um, you want to clearly define and assign security roles. Um, you want to really consider is my HIPAA security officer and the CIO, is that a good idea or should we have some separation of duty? Have we um, let all of our employees know what their responsibilities are to protect the computers that they're issued and the, the information that they work with? And is that in the job description? Um, is, is some organizations go to that extent to define and assign those roles. Um, do the, does the IT department know what they're responsible for? And then do owners of the information, those that work with that information, do they understand what they're accountable and responsible for from a, a security standpoint? Um, implement strong technical controls. Uh, it would be an hour, hours long um, a presentation if I went through all the technical controls. That risk assessment will tell you, based on the risks your organization has, um, what controls need to be in place. There are some obvious ones. Um, I, I would hope that everybody here logs in to their business systems, um, to their Microsoft 365, to their computers with multi-factor authentication and strong passwords, strong access control. Um, again, it's like uh, locking the door to the building electronically. Um, if I have strong keys to the, to the network in the sense of, of passwords, strong passwords and um, uh, multi-factor authentication, then I'm going to be better protected and, and protect my assets. Um, data needs to be encrypted, uh, both when it's uh, stored and when it's in transit. Um, I don't have a slide here on backup um, systems, but there are backup systems that are uh, called immutable, which means the backup is actually encrypted. And because it's encrypted, ransomware um, can't interact with it. And it's very easy to... to Recover when your um, backup tapes are are well are are well protected and um, easily resto restorable, and um, so data should be encrypted. If I were to lose my laptop, um, and we were doing work for for one of Mainer's clients, um, I could reach out to Mainer and say I lost my laptop, but um, your client's data is safe because I've got a very strong password. And the the uh, the hard drive is encrypted, so even if somebody were to remove the hard drive, they're not going to be able to read the data. Um, and, and you want to be in that space where if somebody gets physical control of of an asset, they can't take the data off that asset. Uh, many of you probably don't do software development. Um, the fancy term for uh, software development lifecycle usually speaks to firms that are doing software development. But what we found, we're, we're recommending this for more and more organizations. Uh, the features in our software are updating so quickly. And many people moved to Office 365 at, at the pan, when the pandemic happened. And uh, a lot of organizations did it uh, with a, an eye towards the cost. And they didn't consider the life cycle of the implementation of that of that technology. Uh, a lot of times when we come into our organization, um, the if there are still systems on, on premises, they're not in the cloud, they're out of date. And uh, you want to manage that. If, if a technology is out of date, the vendor may not be providing, most likely is not providing patches. And so um, if you're making a decision to not upgrade servers because of cost, you may be taking on risk that you're not aware of. And so that that uh, secure system development lifecycle isn't just about application development, but it also is about how you manage the life cycle of the technologies in your environment. We um, suggest that uh, organizations um, conduct periodic cybersecurity awareness training. 
we're partnered with a firm and I, I would assume some of you, if you have a security awareness uh, program in place, use a, a company called Know Before. Um, there are other tools out there. Microsoft 365 has some similar tool functionality built into it. And there's another firm called FishMe. Uh, there's a lot of learning management systems that now have um, cybersecurity training built into them. Your uh, cyber carrier might provide training. Uh, training uh, awareness training really um, takes on two parts. The first part is uh, teaching people uh, through through video or, or other uh, mat training materials what is proper behavior on on the computer, how to uh, surf the internet safely and correctly, um, how to properly handle information. Um, every organization has um, uh, specialists that handle or, uh, information. You can uh, you know tailor that that. Uh, training for the people that take credit cards or that handle medical records or that, that they handle financial data. But everybody in the organization needs to learn how to, in the words of one of my clients, not do dumb stuff. And um, so security awareness training um, allows us to teach our, our employees what they can and can't do, what they should and shouldn't do. We recommend that training happens when people are onboarded, so new employees. And then we recommend and some regulations require that employees are um, uh, trained on a regular periodic basis. So annually, um, we have organiz some organizations that do it very, very frequently, monthly or every few months. Some of the, if you've sat down for uh, training, um, they can be uh, hours, an hour long, but they can also be short snippets. Um, that, that just kind of infuse people with a little bit of awareness, a drip at a time, um, but you should do the training. And then the phishing part is where we fish, fish our users, um, where we actually send phishing messages that look like a real phishing message would and uh, give people immediate uh, feedback. If I click on a phishing message um, and, uh, and it's, it's in the test, I'm gonna get a chance to learn that uh, bad English, that uh, a misspelled um, name, um, uh, organization name, a misspelled URL, uh, those kinds of activities or those kinds of tells, if you will, um, that uh, that the the message is um, an attack. Um, then when a real attack comes in, um, that'll allow for the, the user to be a little bit better protected. The other part about um, the Know Before product, uh, Fish Me, and I believe the Microsoft product, is they have the the, the um, functionality to be able to report phishing messages to IT. And so, generally, once you build this culture of um, you've, you've done the awareness training, you've built this culture of uh, all your employees protecting themselves with with proper behavior, um, they'll begin to report the real activity. And we've seen organizations where. Um, five or six people will report the same attack and then IT is able to then discern that there's something focused on that organization and be able to get a message out to everybody to protect the, protect the organization. If I had just a few dollars to spend on cybersecurity and I was in a nonprofit, I would look to a program like the Know Before program. Fish Me's, I believe, is free up to a small number of providers and if, uh, no, a small number of, of users um, and uh, I, I uh, would look at the Microsoft 365 platform as well. You already may be paying for it if you're not using it. It may, may be something that's available to you already. Uh, most important, um, impactful thing is to protect your users. The next thing is we want to plan for disaster. Um, it's with the statistics we looked at at the front end of this, it's really not a matter of when something happens. It's a matter of if something happens. Um, or I'm sorry, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the incident of events is, is just increasing dramatically. Um, again, that stat at the front end was 77% of organizations don't have a plan. Um, there's three kinds of plans. There's business continuity. So can we manage um, in a, in a, in an event that may not be just cybersecurity, can we handle a loss of leadership? 
Can we handle social unrest? Can we handle um, a, a loss of a key uh, service provider? Um, what are we going to do in that event to stay viable as a business? How can we um, quickly return to continuity of operations? Um, cyber carriers and insurance carriers are beginning to ask organizations to have that business continuity plan. Um, disaster recovery is more of an IT issue where business continuity is more of a business issue. Um, disaster recovery is I've lost a system. How do I restore the system? So I have a ransomware event. How do I restore my data? Um, I have a server in the, the data center and um, the hard drive uh, failed. How do I restore the hard drive and recover my data? Um, that's what the disaster recovery uh, plan uh, focuses on. And that's that one is almost entirely focused on IT, though IT needs to know what's the most important, what systems are most important and what um, uh, what the time frame is um, that, that they've got to recover those systems in so that they can do proper planning. Um, but the disaster recovery plans need to be in place. Um, incident response also uh, needs to be defined. Um, that's a written playbook for if a, a problem occurs, that there's a process to investigate that problem, not to call it a breach right out of the gate, to investigate that problem, to determine whether it's, it's truly a security event, um, to investigate it and to see if it's actually an incident. And then if there was data lost or there was an outage that that um, was impacted, uh, that was created by the bad actors, that that is, is now declared a, 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 not a breach until the attorneys are involved, but that, that that's de declared an incident that needs to be investigated. And you know which attorney you're going to call. You know how to reach your carrier. You know um, uh, what order you do that in. And if you have, and we'll talk about cyber insurance here in a moment, um, if you have a policy that has a breach coach, you know, we count, we counsel our clients to call their attorney first and have their attorney call the breach coach because the breach coach is working for the carrier, not necessarily for you. Um, we uh, tabletop those, all three of these kind of plans. And you want to make sure those plans are available somewhere other than your laptop or your file system. Um, when we tabletop, oftentimes one of the mistakes we, we find people make is they store their plans electronically. If you lose access to your systems, you're going to lose access to your plans. Um, again, effective plans are those that are documented. We've taken the time to write them down. Um, we've tested or exercised them. Um, your insurance carrier may do a tabletop. Um, you can go to a third party and get a tabletop done. You can do it on your own. Um, if you just set that security committee in a room and say, what if we were ransomware? and walk through how you would respond. Um, there are uh, plenty of examples in the news. If you want to grab an example in the news and say, well, what would happen if this happened in our organization? Would we know? Um, how would we know? How would we respond? Um, how would it impact us? And those are good conversations for the, for the committee and kind of an inexpensive way to test your plan. Um, but again, you can bring somebody in to have them, have them do it. Plans should be reviewed and updated annually, particularly because technology is changing so quickly. Um, you know, 365 pre-pandemic was in a, I don't know, maybe 10% of organizations, not an official stat, that's a Doug stat. Um, and uh, now it's in almost every organization. Um, if I have a plan that's several years old, um, that my plan probably doesn't cover the technologies that I have in place today. Um, and then we want to make sure that as we appropriately respond, as we respond to cybersecurity incidents, that we catalog them. I mean, if you catalog them and, and uh, report them to the committee and memorialize what's happened um, and how you responded to them, even those events that, that um, you know, one system was ransomed or um, somebody uh, gave their credentials up to a phishing message, but, their password was quickly was changed. Um, if you memorialize those things when there is a bad incident and you've got to um, defend yourselves um, legally, um, those um, the, the, that documentation of how you've managed incidents in the past is important. 
I'm dating myself. Um, Warren Zevon, uh, who's since passed away, had an album um, uh, out um, called Werewolves of London. And one of the songs is Send Lawyers, uh, uh, Lawyers, Guns, and Money. And one of the lines is Send Lawyers, Guns, and Money. Dad, me, Dad, get me out of this. And it's, it's probably a bad joke. I use it all the time. But that's really what insurance is. It's not to protect you, but it's to help you recover. And literally, um, it when an event happens and it's declared a breach, um, the lawyers are going to get involved. Um, guns, not necessarily, but law enforcement very likely will. We've had clients that have had um, Homeland Security in their office, or the FBI in their office, um, because the, the bad actor um, was um, uh, overseas or a part of a crime gang that was being investigated. Um, so many times the law enforcement gets involved and then it takes money to recover. Um, it, it takes money to uh, buy the, the technology um, to, to improve your, your security posture. Um, sometimes it takes money to pay for the notifications if you're in a, in a, a situation where you're duty bound to uh, notify people that, that there was a response. And so the insurance carriers um, provide for that uh, if you have the right coverage. Um, again, because of all the changes in technology and the, um, the, the, the way the market moves, we encourage you, if you have coverage, to talk to your broker about changes in that coverage uh, three to six months in advance of the renewal date. You know, a lot of times we, we uh, get a visit from a broker 60 days in advance. But if your carrier suddenly puts a lot of technical controls on the list of what you have to do to get coverage, um, you may not have the time or your IT team or your managed service provider may not have the time to, um, to actually uh, uh, implement those technologies. So um, I, I would have a regular conversation with your carrier uh, or, or not with your carrier, but with your broker about what the carrier is going to expect. So you're not surprised. Um, several years ago, I think I said this earlier, but I want to repeat it. Uh, several years ago, we were seeing increases in the cyber liability insurance space of 30 to 50%. And so that forced a lot of people out of the market. Uh, the the uh, insurance carriers were requiring multi-factor. They were requiring vendor risk management. They were requiring business continuity plans. And there was a whole list of requirements that were out there. As firms began to meet that, um, the insured firms were seeing less events um, and the carriers were paying out less. The payouts, um, when we first all moved home uh, to work in, in, at home or in a hybrid fashion with the pandemic, ransomware just went through the roof. And so the insurance payouts were, were pretty enormous. Um, that's, that was the reason for the increase. The market's loosened up and settled down a little bit, but it's still, um, as things ebb and flow in the cybersecurity space, still an area that I would encourage you to have regular conversations with your broker about. Then at, at, once you've got a program together, you have a committee to um, provide governance and oversight to it. Um, you've managed the risks, um, whether it's, it's accepting them, transferring, avoiding, or, or reducing them. Um, you want to have somebody come in and take a look at it. Um, it's, now some organizations um, are small, and a, a third party uh, assessment might just be hiring a technical consultant to take a look at the computers for a few hours. Bigger organizations, it's going to be a more involved process. Um, the uh, typical assessment, um, and, and this is the, the process that we follow, we'll come in and assess risk, the, the security program maturity, um, any compliance uh, uh, authorities that you have to meet, the controls, the, the actual controls that are implemented on the network, um, the control, the administrative controls that support the security program, any physical controls where we have systems um, in, a, in a data center on site. Um, we're going to look at what, whether those controls are in place, whether they're properly working, um, and, and uh, whether they're, they're uh, actually doing what they're supposed to do. And we need to include all the technology. We find a lot of times that we're asked to come in and do testing. Um, organizations don't have their arms around uh, their third-party cloud providers, for instance, and we only test part of the environment. 
And so you want to make sure whoever does your testing that they're looking at that entire attack surface, all of the technologies that you've got. Um, we've actually, in moving to the cloud, the simplified things complicated it uh, because we have a lot more cloud implementations, software as a service tools, Microsoft 365, maybe things in Azure if you're a bigger environment or an Amazon. All of that should be tested because it's all an avenue into your organization and the, the data that you have. Um, once you've uh, finished that assessment, uh, most organizations go through a remediation period where they're, they're reducing their risk by correcting the findings. Um, the a typical environment, we've just finished a, a nonprofit uh, health organization. Their managed service provider had not um, removed employees from the active directory. Um, there uh, were uh, people that had, had left years ago that were still there. Um, they were by contract, not scanning, uh, vulnerability scanning the, the network. They weren't patching the network. And we found a whole laundry list of things that needed to be corrected. Some of that correction was an investment that the nonprofit had to make to implement new technologies. But some of it was a, a rather spirited conversation with their managed service provider who wasn't taking care of things that they were contracted to do. Um, so that improvement can be a lot of different things. Technology implemented, policies updated, plans put in place, holding your, your managed service provider to account if you've, if you've got one. And I assume uh, a lot of you probably do. Um, and, and then maturing that program. If that's uh, an all in-house IT program, it's, it's making it more mature. Um, it's, if it's a, a committee, it's making it more mature, which is just a, a, a consulting jargon way of saying improving it um, because we want to continuously improve those programs over time. Um, you may be faced with an uh, organization that says you need to do a penetration test. Um, somebody's trying to sell you a pen test. Um, you should do pen tests, but that should be at that last stage, the managed stage. Um, if I come into your, just be non-technical for a moment, if I come to your house and I uh, assess the vulnerabilities, the weaknesses in the house, your front door is unlocked, your garage door's up, um, I can take you know tools out of the garage, um, food out of the freezer in the garage, kids' bikes are in the front yard. Um, that's an assessment. And a penetration test is when um, somebody is behaving like a bad actor and they actually, in, in the case of the house, come and take the bike or take a tool um, or leave a sticky note or, 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 or um, leave a sticky note in the freezer that says I could have taken, taken the frozen steak um, because I was able to get in. Um, it's better use of your money if you do that exercise where somebody's coming and pretending to be a bad actor in your, your house or on your technology, so to speak, after you fixed it. So the pen test is going to be more difficult if the front door is locked because the assessment identified it, the garage door is down, the kids' bikes are in the garage. Um, that pen test then is going to be against what is a, what should be a secured organization and prove that you're secure. If you start your third-party testing with a penetration test, you let, most likely won't find everything that needs to be corrected. Um, the pen testers will find the easy things and not find the more difficult, complicated ones. So um, the, the process is to do a risk assessment that includes technical testing, um, reduce that risk by mitigating, um, improving your program, and then conducting a penetration test. Some of you, but probably not very many of you, might want to go a formal audit route, like a SOC audit from a CPA firm. Um, but most nonprofits are not in a spot where they're being asked to do that for their stakeholders. But that's the routine of, of third-party assessment. I guess I use third-party twice with two different meanings. The first is that you engage a third party to test your environment. This one is we want to ensure that your third parties are securing your information. Um, in the nonprofit world, we have seen um, organizations uh, like in the for-profit world outsource web development, website hosting, outsource uh, uh, certain aspects of their business to the cloud. Maybe you do fundraising through a marketing agency and they have donor lists. Um, you know, they're back in the day when I graduated from college, you would go and work for an organization and HR was in that organization, marketing was in that organization. Um, but oftentimes now we've said, 
our mission is to take care of this community and HR and marketing and IT, uh, payroll, all of those types of functions are not about our mission. We're not very good at it. We're great at our mission. We're going to outsource. With each one of those third parties we outsource, we create more complexity and we pass on information that we're obligated to protect. And so um, you want to ensure that those third parties are securing your, your information properly. Here's some tips. Um, I, I'll leave this as a, as a homework, um, but I will talk about a, a few of the things. You want to make sure the service providers that you're selecting are properly uh, protecting their organization. Um, I would rehire my service providers every year. I wouldn't necessarily go through the process of an RFP and selection, but I would go through asking these questions. Um, if a service provider is dealing with confidential information, they should be able to tell you what their risk, their, what their risk management program is. It should be written. Um, they should be able to share their, their policies and procedures at a certain level. You don't necessarily want all of them. Um, they should be doing third-party testing. And so whether it's an assessment or an audit or the um, uh, summary of a pen test, you want to see those things. If they're handling your money um, or they're a, a cloud-based service, a, a technology, they should have either a SOC 1 report, which is a, an opinion from a CPA on, on how the funds are handled, um, or, or and or a SOC 2, um, again, an opinion from a CPA that talks about how that program is secured. Um, and you want to have all of those things as part of your vetting process when you're hiring an organization. And again, you want to go through that rehire or that reassessment every year um, for critical organizations. You don't need to uh, manage all of your third parties, but anybody that any organization that you share protected or confidential information with, you should be evaluating their security. We've done assessments for firms where changing our relationship with, with a firm um, uh, reduces the risk. And so you want to take a look at your whole vendor risk and see if we can um, not, not share information with them or not expose them. At one client we had, um, they had seven facilities, each with a different cleaning crew. Each cleaning crew would go in every night and take the uh, trash out of the records room. When we moved the trash can out of the records room into the hallway in front of the records room, um, the need for a business associate agreement and all this third party um, uh, assessment went away. And so you can reduce um, that risk by only giving or exposing confidential information to those that, that needed to do the function. But then those, those once you've narrowed that down, need to be vetted on an annual basis. And here's a list of things that you can use to, to vet them. And then lastly, um, we wanna be safe online. Here's some best practices. Um, we wanna monitor our, our accounts. Um, and, and I'm speaking to all of us really as uh, organizations um, use technology, but we also do personally. So we want to personally routinely monitor our accounts. We want to monitor our online business accounts. Um, are, are there transactions that we um, don't know about, didn't expect? Um, are there users that have been added to systems that we don't expect? Um, uh, so we want to keep, keep our eyes on, on our online accounts. We want to use strong and unique passwords. Um, there, I think it's HIPAA, an eight character password is good enough uh, to be compliant but it's not good enough to be secure. Uh, it's just a math problem and an eight character password can be cracked with the right computer um, in under a day. And we're recommending 12 to 16 character passwords in addition to two-factor authentication. Um, Multi-factor or two-factor authentication is where you have something um, as, as well as know something. So I have a user ID. I know that. I have a password. I know that. And then Whenever I log into a system at GBQ, I have my phone and I have a code on my phone that I put in um, as part of the process. And um, that allows me to, to get in, into the system. That's multi-factor. There's two forms of identification that have to be presented. Um, you want to keep your company information and your personal information current. 
uh, many times we don't um, we don't keep our online account information uh, current, and then old data is in the system, and we go to authenticate ourselves, and um, we can't, uh, or um, you know, mail is going to an old address. Now we got to be real about it. We sign up for things and forget about them, but those those things that we've signed up for that have confidential information, either personally or from a business, needs to be kept current. Uh, be careful of public Wi-Fi. Um, I'm a Starbucks warrior when I'm out on the road. Um, we have a VPN um, that we use. You don't want, just want to get into public Wi-Fi without protection. Um, same thing goes for airports. There are instances of people putting um, uh, fake Wi-Fi access points. Um, they work, but they're put out there as bait to um, get people to connect so the information can be stolen. And if you're not coming through a VPN um, that encrypts the, the connection um, uh, that when you connect to the internet, um, the data is in the, in the air, so to speak, for someone to be able to grab. Um, be a, a wary of phishing and spoofing attacks um, and make sure that, that your antivirus software and applications are up to date. There's a reason why it seems every week I'm asked to make sure my phone's plugged in at night and uh, authorize it to uh, patch. Um, those are generally security updates um, from Apple for me and for many of you probably with other devices. We need to make sure everything we have is kept up to date and patched. And with that, I think we're, we hit the last poll and time for questions. Thank you, Doug. That was great information. Um, I know we'd use no before, so I've do, done a few of those trainings. So yeah. but it was really nice to pick up some tidbits through that. And Brandy, um, if there's questions, I know that was a fire hose to cover everything. But um, if there's questions, I know there's a, I saw the, the uh, reservations and there were a number of Mainer people on the call. Um, I encourage anybody that's on here that has questions to reach out to their Mainer, their Mainer contact and, and or connect with me. My contact information's in there. Um, we're glad to answer questions or talk you through some of these things. Yeah, I think there was a lot to digest, um, but a lot of good information. We didn't have any actual questions in the chat. We did have a lot of people interested in your slides, and um, I do have a couple that I want to follow up with you after. Okay. Um, so, um, but... Overall, thank you, Doug. It was a great presentation. Um, thanks everybody for joining us today. We will be emailing out a recording of this uh, webinar and this presentation um, along with the slide deck and our contact information will also be in that email. But as Doug said, reach out to us if you have any questions or if you need anything further um, in regards to this. Stay tuned for next quarter. We will be talking about utilizing data to provide insightful and visual reports to your leadership the board and others. Um, so we're pretty excited about that presentation also. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. And thank you again, Doug. Thank you. Thanks for having me.